Welcome to Country Fellowship. Glad to see you, if we've not yet met. A big howdy-do uh, from, I feel like Minnie Pearl every time I do that. Uh, I missed you. I was not here last week. I was uh, at uh, the, the, the church where Sammy and I met, and I was serving them as their pastors were out doing something. And, uh, and I did. I, I really did miss you guys. I don't want to make too much of this, but... Uh, they seemed kind of not very alive to me. And uh, so as much heckling as you all do, I guess I like it. And I, I missed it. Um, and I did have, uh, boy, I did have the privilege of listening to the message that Brian Summerall gave if you were here last week. Gosh, that was amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm not ever going to leave if you have people that good coming in. <laughs> what an amazing story and a beautiful analogy. And uh, I, I think uh, there's, there's some reasons why we can't just put that completely out to the public, but I think if you have not heard it, ask Sammy, and I think he will make sure you get an opportunity to hear it. So we are continuing. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke, uh, and we're going to start chapter 7 today. Uh, yes, just, just keep the tortoise and the hare thing in your mind here. Uh, we'll wait till Jerry's gone, then we'll finish another chapter. We always seem to when he's not here. Uh, Luke told us in chapter 1 that he was going to give us an orderly account, and I think that's really important because, I mean, as, as dumb as this may sound, there's a reason chapter 7 comes after chapter 6. And there's, some, there's a story that we're going to study today that is so beautiful that uh, you've probably heard before, but there's, there's a reason why it appears right here in our Bible. I want to read it to you if I can. Luke 7, verse 1, begins this way. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. That's Luke chapter 7. A great story. I'll bet you've heard that before. I, I'm an awful lot of these Bible stories I have heard before. I hope you have too. But there's something very special about this one. By the way, Matthew also tells us this same story. It occurs in Matthew chapter 8. So we're not, uh, uh, we, we don't have to, we, we can make some comparisons to that if we want to. Uh, but there's some things, I, I don't know, I'm just going to confess to you that when I read or sometimes listen to the Bible, I listen to the Bible a lot on audio. And when I'm listening or reading, sometimes I just kind of get lost and things, really important, powerful things, just kind of wash over and I don't take them in. There's a few things that should just jolt you when you read this passage. And if you're, if you're thinking, if you're reading this slowly and carefully, there's a few things that should jump out at you. And so taking the time this week to really mull this over, I wanted to just, let's go through this and let's see what jumps out at us. When Jesus had finished saying all these things in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. Did anybody catch? This is a Roman centurion. I mean, that, that's, that jumps out at me right away. This is not uh, just an average person. The centurions were really battle-tested, hardened soldiers. The very definition, the, the literal translation of the word centurion is one over 100. So he's... He's over 100 soldiers. Now, the actual, they were approximate. It could be anywhere from 60 to sometimes 200. But this is, a, this is a guy who has been in campaigns, and he has seen battle, 
and he has seen death. He may have presided over the execution of people. You know, this is, this is a, a hardened soldier. You don't get to be a centurion without that. He would have been a professional soldier, so he would have been in the military his whole life. And where there maybe were younger people among the legion, this is like, I think of it like a master sergeant or a gunnery sergeant. You know, if you've ever seen the movie Heartbreak Ridge, there's a couple of gunnery sergeants in there. These are professional soldiers. They may not be officers. They work for a living, they'll tell you, right? They may not be officers, but when the shooting starts, they're the one everyone looks to with the experience. Now, there's no shooting in the first century, right? But w during the battle campaigns, these are the people that have the experience. I hope that makes sense. And that should jump out at us. This is a, a hardened, battle-tested military man. And I'll tell you something else. And another pastor pointed this out to me several years ago. And it, the, You know, the Bible speaks well of centurions. There are seven centurions mentioned in the Bible, maybe eight. And all of them are spoken about honorifically. They all have noble character and work to do the right thing. This is really interesting to me, considering that these were killers and leaders of, of an oppressive Roman army. Uh, in, in Capernaum, this is the story we're getting of this centurion, who we don't know the name. In Jerusalem, at the cross, there's a centurion that says, surely, after witnessing Jesus, surely this is the Son of God. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 10, there's a famous story of Peter being taken to a guy's house named Cornelius. And if you're not real careful, you can skip over the fact that Corne Cornelius is a Roman centurion. Uh, Paul makes an appeal to a centurion when he's about to get, get uh, whipped in Jerusalem. And he says, you know, hey, can you do this to a Roman citizen? That's in Acts chapter 22. In Acts chapter 23, there's a plot to kill Paul's life. And he says to another centurion, hey, listen to what this boy says. And, and this person acts on that and saves his life. So my, I think there's another one. The last one is in Acts 27. Where Paul is sailing from Jerusalem to Rome. And he's put into the custody of a centurion named Julius. Who gives him time to visit with his people in Jerusalem before saying goodbye. And then when the ship crashes, the other Roman soldiers want to kill the prisoners. See, because if you're a Roman soldier, there's nothing wrong if your prisoners die, but if they escape, you, you may have to pay with your own life. So after the shipwreck, it's kind of difficult. We don't want to guard these guys. We don't want them slipping away. Let's kill the prisoner. Jul Julius says, no, we're not going to do that. So th these are, the Bible paints these hardened, cruel, vicious soldiers as noble people. And I think that's interesting. That jumps out at me. Maybe, maybe because there are no atheists in foxholes. <laughs> maybe, maybe these people who have seen death and hardship are most prepared to look for and embrace the author of life. I have no idea. But it is really interesting. So this centurion had heard of Jesus around Capernaum. He'd heard of Jesus. A lot of people had heard of Jesus. Luke has told us that, that it's getting, the crowds following him are so large that he has to kind of sneak off and hide. They call them lonely places, right? He has to go hide to be with us. So I guess everybody else is going directly to Jesus with their ailments, and they're, Jesus is healing them. Why isn't this guy? What's his deal? And that's, that's kind of interesting. We don't really know. We know his servant is sick and about to die from Luke. Matthew tells us, my servant lies at home paralyzed in terrible suffering. So, and we, that's all we hear. Maybe he'd hurt his neck. Maybe he'd had an injury. You know, I, I, we have no idea. But he is in terrible suffering and he's paralyzed. So he can't really go to Jesus unless the people have carried people to Jesus. But that's less of an option. So why doesn't the centurion go to Jesus? Well, you, you heard in, in there, he doesn't, he doesn't feel worthy. And some of this is respect for Jewish customs, but some of it is he doesn't deserve to go talk to Jesus. So he's got a dilemma. He knows. He, he's heard of Jesus. He wants to take his servant to Jesus, but he, doesn't, he can't take his servant there, and he doesn't want to go there himself. But it's interesting. The other thing that just, the next flag is he, he asks the elders of the Jews. He has a good enough relationship with the people that he's occupying. He's an occupying army. And he has a good enough relationship with the Jews to ask them this favor. Would you mind going to do this? 
And, and I, you could skip over that. These people hated each other. This would be, uh, you know, like occupying the city of Paris. This would be like a French person in 1946, or 19, or, I'm sorry, 1942 or 43. Thank you. <laughs> Myrtle's helping me out. She's holding up a three. I love it. <laughs> Where are you when I tried out for Jeopardy, Myrtle? 1943, you know, in the occupation of Paris. Can you imagine a, a German officer, I mean, a, a hardened German officer, going to a French person for help? Right? Just imagine that. They hated each other. This is cats and dogs, right? So this, and not only that, they're just, they're just, Jews assassinated Romans when they had the chance. They had these long knives that they would use occasionally to assassinate. If they could get a Roman officer or a Roman soldier alone, they'd assassinate him. And the Romans, they're an occupying army. They routinely abused the, the, the people, the Jewish people. So this, is, this is weird that they have this relationship. It's also kind of weird that he has this relationship towards his servant. He actually cares about the servants. Servants were property in the first century. And I can understand, maybe you don't want to see your property lost, like you would take care of your car or you would take care of another asset, but he, he's actually genuinely concerned about it. In verse 2, we hear that he valued him highly. Verse 7, though, is something else. The word used for servant there is more than just this bond servant, this doulos in Greek. It's a word that you would use for your own son. So when he says, say the word and my servant will be healed, He's using a word that would not be out of line to say, say the word and my boy would be healed. So this, this hardened, brutal, potentially, Roman soldier has concern, deep concern for his servant. Understand, I guess my, these are weird things about the story that maybe we don't stop to think about. So we move on. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with, now the Jewish elders pleaded earnestly with, with Jesus this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Okay. Um, first of all, the word deserve should jump out. They think he deserves this. and We're going to talk about that a little bit later. It, it betrays their theology a little bit. He deserves this. We, we need to appeal to Jesus. And you know what? Our, villain, our vision of God is that God only helps those who deserve it. That's the, and, and that's not true. Okay? And this man is going to acknowledge that, and Jesus is going to acknowledge it. But it's also weird. He loves our nation. He built our synagogue. And this is why I think this chapter 7 comes after chapter 6. It's because he's living out the Sermon on the Mount. Let me quote you a few things from the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Give to everyone who asks. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. You hear that? He loves our nation. He loves us, despite the fact that we're trying to kill him. He's an occupying army. And he helped build our synagogue for no reason. Now, you know, some, some say that you know, the Romans liked people to have their local religions, and they did. They, that, was, that was actually a written strategy of Roman occupation. And it's because they knew something that we're starting to forget, and it's so funny. They knew that if you have a higher moral law, then you can enforce civil law, right? And we have people who believe that you can't legislate morality, and I'm like, no, no, without morality, there's, there's, there's no law. Right? I mean, it's, it's, they've missed it. But, but the Romans didn't care what religion you had. You could worship eggs. Right? By the way, eggs are good. I like eggs. Okay? But you could, you could worship eggs. And they were fine with that. But somewhere in egg worship, they'd appeal to you to obey their laws too. Right? And that's, and that's what they were talking about. And this man, though, he lived among these people. He lived among these people. And he did not consider them filthy. He, he found a way to, to love them. He really genuinely cared for them. He saw them as people. He helped their needs. He responded and initiated with love and kindness, which is what the Sermon on the Mount told us to do. You see that? He's living out 
the Sermon on the Mount, and their response is that they're actually willing to make an argument on his behalf. Now, they're probably sincerely wanting to help, but as we said, they tell him, Jesus, this man deserves this, right? And they're missing it. They think Jesus might be the Messiah, but he needs to prove it. (laughs) They don't really think he's God. And they think that you earn favor with God by being a descendant of Abraham, being physically of the blood of Abraham. That's how you do it, and that's us. But you know what? You should help him out. He's not in our club, but he's been good to us. He deserves this, just like we deserve it, right? Let me, I will never get tired of saying this. You may get tired of hearing it, though. When it comes to salvation and right standing with God, no one is deserving. In, in, a, in a few moments, we're going to invite you to come forward and have a communion service. And unlike some other churches or traditions, we make no effort to determine whether you're worthy. Because I know you're not. <laughs> and, and, and I hope you don't take offense at that. Right? There's no, right? We're not, we're not going to have any examination to see if anybody's worthy. None of us are. And that's, that's what they didn't know. They were completely missing that. And that's, that's where we have to get to in our hearts before we can ask for and receive the help and love and life of the Lord. You've got to get to the lowest level of the basement of the parking garage and realize I'm not worthy, I'm sinful. And from that position, from that position only, you can ask for and receive help. Everywhere else, everywhere else on the elevator, you got some pride left, and it won't work. And it won't work. And that's that's the problem. So, he deserves this, they say. So Jesus went with them. They were not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. And so now here's his dilemma. He knows his position before God. He knows it. He knows, like I hope you and I do, that we have no right standing before God. That as much as we are a beloved creation of God and bear some image of that creation, our minds and our souls are as crooked as a dog's hind leg. And we know that. And so because of that, we can't even think in a straight line. How are we supposed to be able to carry out this stuff? We get that, and contrary to the Jewish elders that say he deserves this, he says, I don't. Now, at some point, people have said, well, wait, he's really just recognizing the Jewish tradition that Gentiles can't come into the home. You know what? He probably does know that. But make no mistake, he is not worthy. He goes on to say, that's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to go to you. So this is a man who knows his position. And here it is. Highlight this. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Right? He doesn't say, say the word, and we'll get into this party. Say the word, and I'll get off of this traffic ticket. See, those are all things that could happen under the authority of men. Who would Jesus have to be for him to say a word and a human being to be healed? He'd have to be God. And this centurion knew that, and the Jewish people around him didn't. And he also knew the power he had. Right? He believed it. He said, For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. This one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. I get how this works. And I would imagine him, because he cares for this This young person that's his servant, probably, because he kind of refers to him as a boy, it's probably someone that he feels like is a son to him. He's probably staying with him, and he's saying, just go go tell Jesus if he says the word, this will happen. He's probably not even looking up because he has that much faith. Because this is, I know how this works. There's a chain of command here. This life is threatened. This is the commander, ultimate commander of life. If he says live, done. Do you get that? That just blows me away. And, and it blew Jesus away too. And th- I'm not kidding. Jesus said, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed. You realize, I mean, do you know what it takes to amaze Jesus? 
I'm, I'm not kidding. I mean, the Bible uses the word. I, this is the great thing about living in our age. It can make me look like I'm such a scholar. All I do is like a Google search. Count how many times in the Bible it says amazed. You can even ask like Cortana or Siri or one of the, maybe even Alexa that, you know. And, and, and it, it's amazing. All the times in the Bible that are used for the word amazed, people are amazed at Jesus, except for two. One is when Jesus went back to Nazareth to preach in his hometown, they could not get over that he was the kid that grew up there. Weren't you the kid that used to play in the streets? Yeah, you know. So he was amazed at their disbelief. And the only other time Jesus was amazed is right here. This Roman centurion who never heard anything of the prophets has a complete theological understanding of his position before God and the authority of the Son of Man. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Don't tell me people in the rainforest cannot be led to God. This Roman knew his position before God and had faith that God could do something about it, and that's it. Is that awesome? Isn't that just, I mean, golly! <laughs> Turning to the crowd then, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well, of course. The author of life just erased that in the manuscript and wrote in the new. That's what he does. And it's contrast, he deserves this versus no, I don't, but I, but I do have faith. See, it is by faith that you are saved and not of yourself lest no one should boast, right? It's not just, that's just beautiful. And so, you know, his condemnation here, of, I didn't even see this anywhere in Israel, is not so heavy in Luke. Matthew's version of this, it's a little bit more of a, uh, an attack. Matthew, remember, is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience, and he does not spare any punches with the Jewish authorities and religious teachers. Matthew then says in his account of this same story, in the middle of this, he says in Matthew 8, 11, and 12, many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. This is not just for you Jews. Many will come from east and west. But the subject of the kingdom will be thrown outside into darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are people who think they're getting in because they were born into it, they think they're getting in because they're a particular church. Well, oh, I, but I've been a Catholic all my life. I don't worry about heaven. You should. Because sitting in a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a chicken house makes you a chicken. And it's not where you were born. It's not who you were born to. It's not what you've done. It's do you have faith and believe by that faith that God, God, that you could say to God, heal your servant. Say the word, and your servant will be healed. <laughs> could you say that? And that that's just blows me away. And I think there's a, a huge parallel here. This centurion was used to identify that Jesus, before his disciples, used this Roman centurion to identify that it was faith, not your physical lineage, that was what got you into heaven. Another, in it just cannot be a coincidence story in Acts chapter 10, another Roman centurion named Cornelius was used to show Peter. Peter went, he had a divine invitation to go visit this Roman centurion named Cornelius. And a whole bunch of people received the Spirit and were speaking in tongues, just like Peter and his buddies had done at Pentecost. And he says, wow, now I know this is not just for Jewish people, but for all men, Right? Both Roman centurions. Can, is that an accident? I don't think so. I don't think so. Great story. <coughs> so, to me, as I've thought about this week, I've asked myself a couple of questions. Because remember, I'm a patient here in the same hospital. If I ever start sounding like a doctor, you just come up and remind me, okay? Or just ask me how the drive to church was. <laughs> thorn in my flesh to remind me that I'm a patient in the same hospital every week. Am I living among the people that God has planted me and the people in places 
where God has planted me like this Roman centurion? Am I living out the Sermon on the Mount that although they were cats and dogs, they recognized that he loved them and that he did things for them? Am I doing that? And you know what? You do not have to go to the Amazon to be a missionary. You just have to go to work. Someone asked Mother Teresa once, what do I do to help you save the world? She looked back and she says, love your family. That's the hardest, isn't it? Sometimes, my wife excluded, she's easy to love, but I got three kids. (laughs) Isn't it? It sometimes takes more nobility of character to love those that are close to us. Familiarity breeds contempt. So that's where it is. Right where you're planted, are you living like this Roman centurion? And then, you know, the other thing that struck me, and I hope, I hope this is for you today, is there any problem you're facing that's so big that God's not bigger? Is there anything wrong with your soul that is so bad that God can't heal, that you can't say, say the word, and your servant will be healed? And you know, that is what amazed Jesus And so my my prayer for you this week is that we amaze Jesus with our faith. And then we look and we watch for him to amaze us with the results. Father in heaven, thank you so much. We stand amazed at you. And we ask that you give us the faith of who we are in you, that you draw us to you and you give us that authority and that power to know with that faith of that centurion that if you say it, it will be done and that we ask you. Father, your your servant stands before you sick. My soul is sick. Say the word and your servant will be healed, Father. Will you heal us and will you give us the eyes to be ambassadors of your love and kindness and healing to those around us like this centurion? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.